Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 24th of September. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by the Citizens Party's founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, pressure builds to open the books on financial corruption. We we're going to reveal a breakthrough that's happened as a result of the campaigns we've been on. And the main story today, wise heads warn against war. Will we listen? And this is this, the most serious issue in the world right now, thanks to the decision that the Australian government took last week. Um, before we begin, as usual, please like this show and share it widely so we can help get the message out. And if you're not already a subscriber, um, subscribe and click the bell icon so you get notification of Citizens Party uh, uploads when we put them up. This week we have a, a, a little update, a five minute update on the Australia Post issue. Um, in the uh, video exposing the hypocrisy of the way the government is, is, has allowed Australia Post to give $250,000 retention bonuses to stop the demoralised staff following Christine Holgate out the door when she was crucified over $5,000 watches. Yeah, 80, 80 Cartier watches worth. 80 right? Cartier watches worth. All right, so have a look at that. And that's the, sort of, that's the sort of material you'll get notified of when we put it up. But, Craig, let's get into it. Um, yeah. Pressure builds to open the books on financial corruption. Now, we have a bit of a theme that we're trying to get people to look at the, the economy in a larger context and the financial system in a larger context. So before we get to the financial system, um, think about what we've said in the last couple of weeks about there's a paradox of the Australian economy we, hi we highlighted a few weeks ago. And the paradox is, despite having supposedly had 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth, that was the refrain. The, the, the mantra, uninterrupted economic growth, we should be the, which, which should make us the wealthiest economy in the world. In that time, our healthcare capacity has shrunk, not expanded. And if we were truly wealthy, wouldn't, have it, wouldn't it have expanded? We, we, we've covered a few of the details of that. I, got, I just want to relay this one um, report that I received a few days ago, Craig. Last week, in, this is in Queensland now. now mm. When you hear about the healthcare crisis in Queensland and Western Australia, what's really flabbergasting is they don't have COVID. No, that's right. right. So this is business as usual. Last week, the Ipswich Hospital had to transfer a patient from um, their ICU to another ICU because they were full. And the closest ICU that they could transfer this patient to was, wait for it, Rockhampton. Now get out a map of Queensland and just see how ridiculous that is, right? This is the state of Australian healthcare. And what's, what, it, what, it, what it shows you is if city people are starting to experience what country people have, have experienced for the past few decades, when all their local health infrastructure was shut down, they were expected to travel longer and longer distances. It's something like three times more risky. There's a three times greater risk, Craig, of um, dying an unnecessary death in rural Australia than there is in the, in the cities, right? Because of the lack of available healthcare. Um, so yeah, why do we have this situation when, when we've had all this uninterrupted economic growth? Well, the answer is it was never really growth. Hmm. What we had was a growth in the financial system, but it was a financial system that was completely um, parasitical essentially. We've had a growth in a parasite over our economy. And a lot of the, a lot of the activity in the financial system is actual corruption. And um, Craig, this became obvious in the in the uh, the, the mortgage market, especially because when you have a financial system this size, in order to sustain it, where it becomes a self um, uh, a, 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 an entity that exists for itself, rather than the whole the purpose of a financial system is to serve the real economy. No, now now the financial system exists in its own right. In order to sustain that, you 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 have to uh, operate parasitically and feed off human misery, right? And you break rules and you do all sorts of things. And you know we've seen that with the with the kind of mortgage fraud that's happened in Australia. Um, and that's why we're highlighting this question of financial corruption, because we have to clean it out, not just for the sake of being true and honest and having you know a just financial system, but so we can have a financial system that serves the real economy, mm. right? And that that's that's the big issue. So the the breakthrough is. Um, We've just received word uh, this week that at the start of the month, when we went on a week of calls around uh, the Sterling First issue 
and Sterling First are the are the uh, the elderly people in a lot of them in Western Australia who are the victims of this uh, rent for life scheme that they got sucked into, um, and they've just been abandoned. These victims and they can't start again, etc. So we went we we went on a round of calls all around Australia. People called politicians to say you must compensate the victims of Sterling First, and we need an inquiry into Sterling First and into ASIC. And this week, the Labor Party participating in a in a, um, a function in Western Australia, a, a victims uh, forum, the Labor Party, two rather influential Labor senators, um, actually uh, uh, admitted or, or, or acknowledged the need for an inquiry. Right? This is this is a very very important um, development because you have to open the books on this. And I want to read some quotes that emphasise just how important this actually is now. Because this Senate has been pretty um, effective for a while now in uh, standing up to the worst things that Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg want to do vis-a-vis -vis the financial system. And one example of that is they've stood up to the, 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 the push to water down responsible lending laws, for instance. Um, they, did a, they did a good job in getting an inquiry up into Australia Post, right, which we're, which we're really happy to see. So this Senate is, has enough people in there that want the truth to come out. They are the only resistance institutionally that I can see, Craig, in Australia to what Frydenberg is doing, which is just um, dismantling all the protections for consumers effectively, all of the, all of the, um, the restrictions on predatory practices, and he's put this new guy in charge of ASIC named Joe Longo. And Joe Longo is essentially telling the predatory banks, go get them, boys. And here, here are the quotes. Um, so this was, this was from the Australian Financial Review, 21st of September. Um, uh, there was a, uh, uh, the Association of Financial Advisors, and Joe, that this new ASIC chairman, Joe Longo, uh, addressed. Um, he, and these, I just want to give you the flavour of some of the things he told these guys, right? He said, oversight of the financial advice industry would not increase under his watch. So, you know, don't worry about us. We, we're the cop on the beat, but you'll never have to worry about us. Um, he announced that ASIC would release new guidelines to help the industry ditch its, quote, unduly conservative approach to compliance. Compliance means following the law, right? You guys... This, is, this has become unduly conservative. You guys are, are risk averse when it comes to compliance. I mean, how can those two sentences, those two terms coexist in the same sentence, right? It, 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 everything he's saying is, just go about your business, guys. Don't worry about us, the cop on the beat anymore. Um, he warned that a more deregulated market put the onus on investors to be informed about the advice they receive and the risk of market losses. This is what he said, quote, when a consumer comes to seek financial advice, there needs to be some effort on their side to understand the risks involved in any investment. People who seek advice have a responsibility to inform themselves. The legal obligation is, quote, is not, quote, all on the advisors. And Craig, that is as accurate a, an expression of, of the doctrine of caveat emptor mm. that you'll ever see. They're saying... Mm. And here's what happens when they say this. They're, they're basically putting it out there to remind people that when little old granny, who probably doesn't even know how to use the internet very well, right? And I'll, I'll give you a scenario with Sterling First people, right? Little old granny's in a big five-bedroom house. She's had the kids, you know, the grandkids, etc. cetera. She's, she's thinking, I don't know how many years I've got left on my life. You know, oh, here's an opportunity, I'm being told, I can downsize this house and l move into a smaller place in Mandurah, on the beach, lovely little retirement place, and all i got to do is pay uh, all the rent in advance. Mm. So, and that's, you know, I'll sell this house for $500,000 and I pay $300,000 and that's all the rent in advance and that'll cover me for the rest of my life. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's just a little old lady hearing about an opportunity that fits her perfectly. I'm going to do that. And what Joe Longo is saying is, if that woman gets sucked in, that little old grandma gets sucked in by these super slick salesmen who are saying, sign here, granny, sign here, granny. Oh, we're going to put your money into a trust. See, that, see this says this account. This is what they did. This account, we're going to put your money into. It's called Sterling First Trust. See, it's in a trust. 
The word trust, that's a good word, isn't it, Granny? Put your money in there. And it was never a trust. It was just a bank account with the name trust on it. Right? That's what they did. And that Granny, according to Joe Longo, is now obliged to think like a Philadelphia lawyer or a Pitt Street lawyer and have it over those guys and have done all her research, etc. When ASIC knew that those men talk, sitting around the table with Granny talking her into it had a record a mile long with, with um, financial catastrophes in their wake and thousands of victims already. And they didn't inform Granny, but it's Granny's fault for not informing herself. That's what Joe Longo is saying. Yeah. Robbie, look, what you just outlined, I, mean, I, I wanted you to outline that in one block because, look, what we're talking about is a process that's been going on well and truly now for over 40 years. The takedown of our economy, starting with the reforms of the Montpelerin Society. Yep. This was a deliberate invasion of our country to literally destroy government, destroy regulators and promote the private banking system. We've seen the sell-off of our private... Uh, you know, pro uh, privatisation of many assets. The hospital system is basically the privatisation of health, yep. as we've seen. So it's been priced out to make a profit. That's what's going on here. Now, there is a solution to this, and that's what we represent as a citizens' party, whereby we say, no, what comes first is the general welfare of the population, not the profit of the big banks. Yep. That's a big, big difference. Now, this used to be the old Labor Party's policy. You know, Ben Chifley, John Curtin understood this. In fact, you know, there was a number of ministers in the, even in the Gough Whitlam's government, understood this principle and they fought for it. Unfortunately, it's very weak to say, and that's putting a, a, a bit of a spin on it amongst the Labor Party today. But sure. what we represent, look what we represent, we represent those principles of national banking, of having strong corporate regulators like ASIC. ASIC should be a regulator not some tool of the government to promote their economic policies, which is what they're coming to becoming to be. Well, at this, Joe Longo's predecessor, the, who they got rid of last year, said the banks should fear us. Yeah. That's what he said, the opposite of what Joe Long, those Joe Longo comment, quotes are. Yeah. They, got, they threw him out, Morris, Frydenberg got rid of him, and you got this guy, Longo. So, so you've got the Bankers' Party in power now, right? So we don't have Glass-Steagall to protect ordinary deposits. They've tried to bring in bail-in. Yep. They've tried to ban cash, right? Now, we've defeated those policies, or the, the bail-in is still in the process of you know, legislation going through the parliament. But these are the sorts of policies that we represent and can be stopped. Now, it does require people to stand up. Now, right now, we're in the process of re-registering our party or going through the registration process. We need 1,500 members because there's another reason the government doesn't want a strong voice in political parties. They just want to have parties that go along you know, with the rest of the, the two, the two well, major parties, not just the government, Craig, it's both it's Labor as well. They have they absolutely. Are both, they're both threatened by the growing uh, third party vote, and they're trying to make it much more difficult for well, those parties. Conservatively, Robbie, last federal election, twenty five percent of people didn't vote for the major parties. Yeah. So that's growing. I heard figures of thirty five percent in the Senate. And the point is that what we represent as a party is a completely opposite policy to what you see with the Bankers' Party called the Liberals at the moment and yep. the very weak Labor Party, which most will become a Bankers' Party as well because they won't stand up for very much at the present time. So what uh, you know, we're on a membership drive at the moment. People can have a look at our website and if they're interested, they can join us as members. We actually treat our members like members. We're not just tick and flick like Clive Palmer or something, you know. We actually do want people to learn what happens in our party and how we approach the issues of the day. Well, very good point, Craig. Uh, we, we, we don't just want members, like you said, for the sake of it. We ask our members to act. And as I just reported, the kinds of actions that we do, like we did uh, at the start of this month, we are now seeing signs that the Labor Party is shifting. If Labor, if Labor decides that we do need an inquiry into ASIC, um, the crossbenchers, that, that, that'll make it happen, right? Because the crossbenchers are already going to be in favour of it and the government can't stop it. And if we can get an inquiry that the Senate writes the terms of reference, not the government, um, then we can open the books on all this. And there's a lot to come out, right? Absolutely. The Royal Commission, it's two and a half years since the Royal Commission, a lot, of that's, a lot of that's gone nowhere. We have to not accept that. Okay, let's move to the major story of the day now. Wiser heads warn against war. Will we listen? And, uh, Craig, it doesn't get more serious than this. Now, we're going to talk about uh, this AUKUS deal, Australia-United Kingdom-United States deal, that we touched on it last week just after it had broken. Um, and, of course, the, the target of this, that deal is China. And uh, we are the, 
We're the only political party in Australia, Craig, that's prepared to uh, disagree with the majority of Australians on China. We always, Robbie, this is an important point because right back since 1988, you know, we've been associated internationally with the LaRouche movement. Lyndon LaRouche, when he was alive back in 1985, proposed the idea of the, uh, the productive triangle in uh, in uh, in Europe at that particular time as a way of dealing with the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and you know the re-establishment realignment of uh, of of, um, of Germany. Now that led to things like the idea of a transcontinental railway system yep. in terms of the what we call the Eurasian trans Eurasian railway system. Yeah. Trans Eurasian, and so this is what we've been, and that involves China. So we've been talking about the development of China ever since we started in our organisation, you know, 30 years ago. And the idea of China being a, you know, uh, some sort of uh, an entity that's out there to create wars is absolutely insane. And what we've seen in the last period of the last, just the last several years is the, the subject of today's discussion. Well, that's it's the insane. thing. It's how sudden it's changed. And, that's, and people have to reflect on that. And we are going to say what we're going to say, despite the fact that, no other political party would because 80% of people are anti-China in Australia. Now, we want to be popular, Craig, because we're a political party, but we are not populist. Mm. And a populist is someone who tells you what you want to hear to get your vote. We're not ever going to tell you what you want to hear to get your vote. We're going to tell you what we have worked very hard to find out is the truth. And we're going to try and persuade you as to why that is the truth. That's right. right? Because um, uh, you're not going to, you know, the media presents things in a superficial way, etc., and we know that the consequences of where we're going is dangerous. And so the first thing to reflect on is why did this change so quickly? Well, Robert, look, it's in the DNA of the Liberal Party. I'm sorry, but if you go back, look, we wrote uh, a uh, pamphlet, you know, The Rise and Fall of Australia, which is incorporated in the true history of, of, um, of our country, which we put into a pamphlet. And we go through, and this is what makes us unique as a political party, we studied history. We went to the National Library in Canberra for weeks. You went there. I've spent right? hundreds of hours in lo state library archives, university library archives, military library archives <laughs> to find original documentation to, tell, to draw out this, this story of Australian history. And you find that, you know, you discover like, uh, so, so Sir Robert Menzies, the great so-called wartime prime minister, was more interested in becoming... The, the, the leader of the wartime effort in Britain than he was in Australia. He actually you know, was fawning all over the British and he basically left Australia completely undefended. Defenders, defenseless. To, yeah, yeah. So in 1941, 42, when uh, you know, Australia was facing Japanese invasion, the policy of what we call the Brisbane Line came into play. Right? This was a policy of basically, and most, a lot of people don't know this, that the Liberal Party's policy was to cede most of Australia to the Japanese from a line from basically Brisbane to Adelaide and then they have a scorched earth policy to destroy everything above that line to basically give North Australia away. That was the policy of the Liberal government because they were, they, they were listening to the British at that time to say, and the, British, that, you know, the government didn't believe it, but the public line was that uh, the British would come and save Australia. Yeah, from right? Singapore. Singapore. Uh, and after Singapore... You know, that was proven to be false. Now, that Brisbane line is very, very sensitive. They even have a Royal Commission about it, Robbie, and they, that Royal Commission said, oh, no, this thing didn't exist. Yeah. But just a few years ago in 2017, this lady, Sue Rosen, who is a heritage consultant and historian based in Sydney, actually dug up in the forestry archives of all places reports to say that this scorched earth policy in the Brisbane line was, in fact, the policy that this was what the, uh, the the leaders signed off on the political leaders at the time, you know, even so, uh, General Douglas MacArthur referred to the Brisbane line as being the policy. Now, think about that. If the government of the day is prepared to give our country away and not fight for it, which didn't happen, thank God, under you know Curtin, Ben Chifley and, and Curtin. Yep. What's the mentality of this Menzies history, which is the Liberal Party? Well, and. The, yeah, Th that and, <laughs> and the, Craig, they use the same language. I'll give you the example. Uh, Morrison referred to it this week. Our great and powerful friends. The yes. last leader to say that was Sir Robert Menzies. Yes. Right. In other words, we in Australia are vulnerable to you know we we will our our security comes from our great and powerful friends. Yeah. Now, um, and it's interesting if we start from World War Two though, and, and and quickly make our way forward. Consider what World War Two. What we were we were under threat by an Asian power. But it wasn't China, 
It was Japan. It was a, Japan was a fascist country, which in fact had been in alliances with the British Empire for decades. Actually, the Japanese em fascist empire had been in alliances with the British Empire for decades. And then they went on their, 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 um, their uh, fascist conquest. John Curtin broke with our sycophantic relationship with the British to say, OK, we are definitely under threat. We need, to, we need to determine our own security. And that's when the alliance with the United States started. And it worked and we got and we defeated the Japanese. Right? It only worked, Robbie, because also going with that policy was one of massive industrialisation yep. through the funding of the Commonwealth Bank that acted, that acted at that point like a national bank. So we transformed our manufacturing sector overnight pretty much in order to be able to fund that war from you know, munitions and so forth. From a, from a strategic standpoint though, Craig, there were two elements to the, essential to the victory against Japan that most people never hear about in Australian schools. One was the, the, what, the, the rear guard fight in China against the Japanese. China was our ally, including the communist Chinese, right? They're all fighting Japan and um, they suffered terrible losses fight in Japan, but that was very important. And then ultimately, um, it wasn't the bombing of the two cities that, that, that brought Japan to the, the, uh, the surrender table. It was when the Russians said they were going to turn, the, the, you know, the, the, the war against Germany had ended, and the Russians said, okay, we will now uh, enter into the war against Japan, and it was all over. So two countries, Craig, China and Russia, who then straight after that were turned into our enemies for the Cold War. The Cold War ended in 1990, right, 1989-1990. Um, and what's happened since then, instead of that being an opportunity, that, that, that's the history you're now talking about of the Eurasian Land Bridge and the whole concept behind the Eurasian Land Bridge, which is now Belt and Road, was this idea if we can all, let's, let's all build the infrastructure that can uplift us all together, change the circumstances that lead to conflict, right? That's the economic development can be the basis for peace, which is essentially the slogan of our party's foreign policy, right? Mm. Peace through economic development. Um, and it was a huge opportunity there. Instead, neoconservative geopoliticians in the United States and the United Kingdom, who can, they can only think in terms of balance of power politics. They, they said, we, the United States and the Anglo-Americans have to be the sole un unchallengeable superpower and we will not tolerate the rise of any other. And th there's, there's three countries that are potential rivals to that. India is the third, it's way behind though. Um, Russia is not economically a rival to that, but militarily if it came to it, Russia would be formidable because of its nuclear weapons. But the country that has, that it's the total package is China, right? And so what's happened is, those politicians and those, those neoconservative geopoliticians have, have recreated the Cold War essentially. And China is the one that we're dealing with, that we have to deal with here. So what's happened, the, the, the things we want to highlight that have come out since Morrison's announcement last week, um, is once again, it's the older generation of Australian uh, government, diplomatic and military officials who are the ones warning about where this is heading. And take stock of that for a minute. People with real experience in government over decades, including overlapping of the Cold War, they're the ones that are saying, whoa, what's going on here, right? Watch yourself, Australia. This is heading towards war. You've got these young Turks um, who are sycophantic to the Anglosphere around Scott Morrison, who are the ones pushing the other way, right? So that's something to, to take to consider. Because as I said, it has changed very quickly. In 2014, Xi Jinping addressed our parliament and Australia and China signed a comprehensive strategic partnership. Even in 2019, Scott Morrison, as the treasurer then, was issuing statements welcoming the contribution of the Belt and Road to our region. Right? As, as, middle, as, as recently as 2019, all that has now changed. So what we've got, we've covered this extensively in this week's um, issue of the Australian Alert Service, our, our uh, weekly magazine. And I want to read you some of the segments of some of the articles. So. Some of the people that have come out include Paul Keating. <clears throat> so Paul Keating uh, wrote, uh, well, this, is, this, is, this was in uh, a column in WA Today on, on the 20th September. He said, the announced agreement between the United States, Britain and Australia for Australia to move to a fleet of US supplied nuclear submarines will amount to a lock-in of our military equipment and forces with those of the United States with only one underlying objective, the, for, the ability to act collectively in any military engagement by the USA against China. 
This arrangement would witness a further dramatic loss of Australian sovereignty as material dependency on the USA would rob Australia of any freedom or choice in any engagement it may deem appropriate. This is, this is the key word there being sovereignty. Mm. This is the people around Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton in the parliament, including these, these juvenile wolverines, Andrew Hastie and um, James Patterson, and etc. They harp on it all the time about sovereignty. We can no longer fight war on our own. We, we can only fight war with the United States now. That, by definition, means no sovereignty, right? Um, and so you've got to take stock. What does it mean to fight war with the United States? Well, let's just look at them since World War II. World War II was the right war to fight, but since then, every single one's been an unmitigated disaster, right? You know, take, take stock of that. Another person who's spoken out, Craig, is Hugh White. Um, now, Hugh White used to be a secretary of the Department of Defence, and he was the, actually he was the, the founding boss of this think, the think tank ASPI, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, which is now a US-funded foreign interference operation in Australia that has more than any other institution is responsible for this lurch to war. But back then, when it started, it was just more of a, 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 a think tank. Hugh White wrote in the Saturday paper, last Saturday, he said that as crazy as the French submarines project was, um, they're called the attack class submarines, from every standpoint, the new plan that Morrison has just announced is worse. Quote, it will make the replacement of the Australian Navy's fleet of Collins-class boats riskier, costlier and slower. And it deepens our commitment to the United States military confrontation of China, which has little chance of success and carries terrifying risks. And that was his, that was his contribution. Then it, it, he um, elaborated that more fully. Now... For the sake of time, I want to go through some of these things uh, quickly because there's, a, there's another person we're about to, to, to um, quote in great length who's written an article for our publication, and Australians need to know that. But just a couple of things quickly. What is this threat that we're doing all this against? What is this threat from China, right? Is it China's military build-up? Now, that's all hyped. Have a look at this graphic we're going to put up on the screen. This is from, this was just... Uh, published by CNBC in, in America in an otherwise terrifying article about how war, war gamers, you know, pimply-faced kids writing algorithms in computers, working for the RAND Corporation, etc., uh, you know, they, they, they war game scenarios, right, and think that's how you fight warfare. And, oh, oh yeah, well, see, the computer says, well, win, go get them, boys, right? But look at the actual facts. Look at the state of American uh, military, uh, sorry, Navy, as opposed to, you know, yeah, China has built its up, it built up its a lot in recent times, but it's nowhere near the United States yet, right? Um, just, you know, what it, that so much of this stuff is always hyped. What else? The South China Sea, is that, a, now that's the number one reason I get told that China's a threat, because of the South China Sea. Let's just look at some facts here. Now, the South China Sea claim of China's is called the Nine Dash Line. And, yeah... And, you know, it's got to it's it's got to compete with Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. And they've all got claims, right? And they all overlap and whatever. Now they know it's a it's a it's a plate of spaghetti in there, right? Those countries which are called ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, they have an agreement with China that it's, it's sort of like an agreement to disagree, but over time resolve it peacefully. That's that's the overarching agreement. The United States military sails through there with all its firepower saying, no, no, we, we will bring order to this, to this mess, except no, the Chinese have never interdicted one ship that, we, that is there for so-called freedom of navigation, or one trade ship, because all the trades with China, right? But what's the reality about the claim itself? Let's just focus on the claim. Yeah, oh, that looks like China's being greedy. That claim, that nine dash line, Craig, was written was was drawn in 1947 by Nationalist China, not Communist China. And in fact, at that time, it was an 11 dash line. It was even bigger. Our ally, Nationalist China, wrote that line. China, when it took when the Communists took power, they reduced it to nine dashes. They they took they they some of it went up in the Gulf of Tonkin, and they took that bit out to to not be as provocative to the Vietnamese. And now it's that line. Now they keep they say. That is their claim for the South China Sea, right? But it wasn't, the, it wasn't Mao Zedong and the commies who did this. It was our nationalist allies who did this. And to this day, wonderful democratic Taiwan, who we're going to go to war to fight for, 
claims the same line hmm. and is also building up islands in the South China Sea with the intention to defend that line. Taiwan is. This is not something that's the CCP trying to, this is CCP assertiveness. No, the CCP wasn't in power in 1947 when this assertiveness started. So, you know, learn history, people, before you just get this, this, this um, uh, drummed into you. And then I have to highlight this. Uh, we're going to get, I want to get, a, we're going to talk a bit more about Taiwan, but in, to, in 2004, let me just read you a section from, a, from an ABC News report in 2004. Downer prepared to stand against the United States over Taiwan. Stand against the United States. Now, Alexander Downer, he is now in lockstep with all the rest of them. As sycophantic as John Howard and Downer will have always been, Craig, to the American relationship, in 2004, a year after the Iraq war, uh, I'll just read a section of this out. Speaking of matters diplomatic, Foreign Minister Alexander Downer has taken Australia one extra step closer to China and sent a strong counter signal to the United States. Any military conflict over Taiwan has long been seen as the crucial test for Australia in what's become a delicate diplomatic balancing act. Now Mr Downer says that Canberra would not be obliged to help the US in any military standoff over Taiwan, contradicting the Bush administration that said such help would in fact be expected. And Downer said that when he was in Beijing in 2004. Now, that is, a, that is like a high watermark of even someone as pro the US alliance as John Howard and Alexander Downer were prepared to be in two, at that time, right? Everything has changed since then. Now the, now, the people who are pushing this agenda say that the change is all Xi Jinping's fault. And I'm, we're about to show you that it's actually not. So... Um, the, the, the main feature of our alert service this week is an article by a former Australian diplomat named John Lander who wrote it for our alert service. It's called China, Australia Squandering 40 Years of Goodwill. The author worked in the China section of the Department of Foreign Affairs in the lead up to the recognition of the People's Republic of China in 1972, which is when we started um, recognising Communist China. He was Deputy Ambassador in Beijing in 74-76. He was heavily involved in negotiation of many aspects in the early development of Australia-China relations. Um, and then also later on, John Lander was Australia's ambassador to Iran in the 1980s. And so he's written this article and it starts off, Craig, by actually uh, showing concretely how once upon a time there was a commitment in Australia to more independence, mm. right? Uh, and he cites something called the Policy Planning Paper, QP 11-71 of 22, 21 July 1971. This was a Department of Foreign Affairs paper. It argued that there was, quote, cause for concern whether our alliance with the United States can protect us at every step from political disadvantage resulting from the manner in which the United States conducts its global policies. The American alliance in a changing power balance will mean less to us than it has in the past. If anything, this argument has been strengthened by recent US actions and America's failure to consult us on issues of primary importance to Australia. Afghanistan, anybody? Mm -hmm. Accordingly, we shall need, now more than ever, to formulate independent policies based on Australian national interests and those of our near neighbours that will enable us to react quickly to developments in the United States policy towards China and Indochina. Now, um, if time permitted, I was going to go through a lot more of this. I really urge everyone... Get the, get the Australian Alert Service. If you've never received one before, you can call in and get a free copy. Um, otherwise, you, know, you can even subscribe to the Australian Alert Service and get it weekly because a, an article like this by someone like that is what you need to, to know that there is a counter position to this overwhelming insanity coming out of Canberra that's going to lead us into a war. Um, so I won't go through all the details, but I just want to highlight the one thing that John Lander suggests is necessary if we truly want to repair the relationship and what you know if we want to if we want to preserve our trade with china which has been very very important for australia right and lots of exporters who have had their markets smashed etc will know what i'm talking about if we want to do those things he suggests there's one thing more than any other that we can do to start to repair the relationship and he points out this recently joe biden reiterated to the chinese that america stands by its um, uh, position on Taiwan. 
and it's the position that Taiwan, that China agrees to, right? Which is that you, you treat China for, you know, the formal relationship is with China proper and you only deal informally with Taiwan because both, con both Taiwan and China claim each other as the real China, right? Um, and, and Joe Biden actually reiterated that. And John Lander is saying all Australia needs to do to take so much heat out of this relationship is to reiterate that he said a public statement could be issued reaffirming the terms of the joint communique on the establishment of diplomatic relations, which is a so-called Paris Agreement of 21 December 1972. So this is a statement we made back then, right? So we've already made it and it's, we've, never, we've never rescinded it. This is still our position. He's just saying reaffirm it because that statement, that communique said, the Australian government recognises the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China, acknowledges the position of the Chinese government that Taiwan is a province of the People's Republic of China and has decided to remove its official representation from Taiwan before January 1973. End quote. And John Lander says this would concede nothing that has not already been conceded. It could include a reminder of the understanding underpinning Australia's recognition of the People's Republic of China that Beijing would designate the province as a special administration region with the ability to determine its own system of internal government. But nevertheless, it would reassure China that we are not interested in, in breaking apart Taiwan from China. Right, because that's the that's the number one cause of alarm here. Now, I wanted to. Um, uh, I, I'm just going to reference it, Craig. It's 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 available on our website, and we can put it down below. I'd hope to play a bit of an excerpt of it, but um, uh, we don't have to worry about that. But if you want to hear uh, real experts emphasise the importance of Taiwan and why, when we and America start saying, oh, you know. Taiwan should be, democratic Taiwan should be freed from China, etc. We are destroying the bedrock of our relationship with China, right? And this is the Singaporean expert saying this. So there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a podcast on our, that we link to on our website, which we've transcribed and people can read that. And it's by Kishore Mahbubani, Singapore's former uh, ambassador to the United Nations and George Yeo, Singapore's uh, foreign minister. And they're giving us advice as countries saying, you want war with China? Keep it up. If you don't want war with China, if you actually seriously want to solve problems, consider carefully what you're doing. Understand the significance of some things more than others, like this Taiwan issue, and take it seriously, right? Because I don't want war. Um, and the question is, do we want war? So Craig, the question for the Australian people is, do we want war? And if we don't, what can we do to make sure we don't have it? First thing is rob people have to, as you say, educate themselves about what the realities are and stop, instead of just having uninformed opinions, realise that their opinions are being shaped by forces that have yep. that intent to go to war. One of the important things I think that we have to understand, and I'm being older of course, you sort of, in the 70s and the 80s, if a country wanted to develop it only had a choice of going to the World Bank and to the IMF. Yep. And the West, with its West and corrupt Western banking practices, would stick what's called conditionalities on those loans and that credit. So if they wanted to develop themselves, they had to meet certain conditionalities. And this absolutely destroyed countries. So you go to the IMF and go to the World Bank, you end up getting destroyed. And, uh, you know, things like appropriate technologies. If you wanted to develop nuclear power, you couldn't. No, uh, you're not allowed to do that, right? They would say, here, look, you can hook up a bike to a generator and you can get electricity that way. Just get someone to pedal it all day. That's right. So that's, that's the sort of for your country. Yeah, like Africa, right? Yeah. So you see the impoverishment of Africa for the last 30 years has been a result of the Western policies. But there's a new player on the block, Robbie. It's called China with the Belt and Road policies. 160 countries have signed up for development policies. China is working with those countries in order, and, so, and they have access to credit to build real infrastructure. Now, of course... The West is saying, oh, no, no, this is China wanting to take over those countries. But it isn't. It's been part of the process of, you know, you look at what China's done to itself internally, lifting millions, of, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's the intention of what China wants to do around the world. So, so in fact, Craig, our position is actually one that's very isolating in the world. For, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are isolating ourselves by this position because the vast majority of the world wants to go in this pro-economic development direction. That's right. And this is what the craziness is about Australia. We're in a vastly empty country. We could 
desperately need, need partners to develop our country, high-speed rail, the water projects, you know, all of that sort of thing that we've talked about many times in this project. We are crying out for this, but instead we're listening to the old so-called allies that we've seen yep. destroy our country or attempt to destroy our country in the past, and it's only from brave people like John Curtin and say, look, we don't want to go with that old idea, that old regime where we're just you know, treated like cannon fodder, like World War I. This is what we're dealing with here now. And you know, we have a brilliant potential to, as, as was the case. I mean, Scott Morrison, you know, Dan Andrews, who still supports the Belt and Road Project, you know, we could be participating in the world's greatest economic development project system. But no, this is the threat to the Western financial yep. nations of, and, and the financial banking system. And Craig, just to explain one thing quickly, because we have this, you know, people might be confused, but when we talk about the difference between World War II and now, because in World War II, it was right for us to ally with the United States, but what people have to appreciate is um, the United States changed after World War II, and its own president said so. Mm. Richard, uh, sorry, Dwight Eisenhower, a great general, you know, who, who knew that he'd been part of the American tradition that you didn't have really standing armies, you built the army up if it was needed, but the, but the military should not exist as an entity, a real entity in its own right. By the time he was finished, he warned against the rise of the military industrial complex, right? Because then war becomes its own, a reason for its own business. And, and this was not just an American thing, it was an American and British thing. And Australia is increasingly part of that. You know, the only production America kept, has kept for itself is military production. All the rest of manufacturing it was happy to outsource. But it does have military production, and there's only a few countries that get to share in that. And more recently, Australia and has, has become one of those countries. It's Australia, Britain, Canada, and us are sharing in that, right? We are part, therefore, of this military-industrial complex that John Lander points out when Joe Biden, in a very good move, actually, insisted, no, no, we are going to end the 20-year war in Afghanistan. That 20-year war had been a $300 million a day cash cow for this war machine, the war industry. A $300 million a day cash cow. Well, if there's no war... How do they justify that kind of spending? Well, now they're going to uh, ramp up this stuff against China and all the money just starts to flow again. That's right. right. And that's the difference. So we're not talking about what America used to be like. We're talking about what America is now and what we've become now, etc. And um, I think, the, Robbie, the, uh, the issue on this program today, what we're saying is people learn from history. For sure. Craig, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks to the viewer. Um, if you, if you can, please become a member. Like I said, like and share and uh, subscribe to this, to this uh, show. Get on, our, get on our website and uh, look up things like a reference with the, these two Singaporean experts talking about the Taiwan position if you're interested in that. Um, and you should be interested in that because these are the factors that are driving our policy at the moment. And thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of The Citizens Report. Tune in next week for more. Mm -hmm.